Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Gail, for uh, those uh, kind words. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I, I usually am speaking, and people have never had a problem hearing me. And I hate using these things. But if I don't use this, can you guys hear me in the back? OK. Why don't I just yell, because that's my favorite tone. I don't know how you turn this off. Uh, and if you can't hear me, just yell. Um, I'd like to uh, also thank, beyond Gail, I want to thank uh, Professor Reese, of course, Dr. Maddox, Dr. O'Neill, and the Center for Regional Studies for inviting me to speak today. Uh, this is my first time speaking at the Naval Academy. I'm used to speaking to uh, groups who are armed uh, because I got my start as a prosecutor and I used to speak to uh, uh, cops a lot. And then when I worked for Sam Nunn, I used to speak to a lot of military institutions. And I'm glad to see one thing, because usually I was the guy standing between armed men and women and lunch. Now I'm glad to see at least you're eating. I feel a lot safer if you don't like my speech. Uh, I also want to take time to uh, thank one of your colleagues, uh, Aaron Ho, who uh, took me on my first tour of the yard. And it was a fascinating and actually interesting uh, experience. I always enjoy the opportunity to discuss my agency's unique oversight mission in Afghanistan. But I'm especially honored to be speaking to you and speaking this week. Since this week is the 14th anniversary of the beginning of hostilities in Afghanistan. Think about that. This is our longest war, and it is not over yet. More importantly, I'm grateful to be speaking to you because you, as midshipmen, are pursuing a career of service to our country. You will soon be at the forefront of carrying out US foreign and military policies around the world and keeping America safe. I commend all of you for that noble and worthy pursuit, especially as we face a multitude of threats around the world and also within our continental United States. Hopefully, what I discuss today will help you. If it does, then I've accomplished my mission for today. Now, I know this is your lunch hour, and I know you're eating. I wish I was eating, too. It smells good, pizza. Uh, but uh, I'm going to try to speak as fast as I can to allow you to ask questions, where I think that actually may be most helpful. And remember, as I told some students out at uh, one of your rivals, Princeton, just the other day, there are no things as dumb questions. There are only dumb answers, and that's my job to give you a dumb answer. So ask away when the time arises. Uh, why do I think it's important for you to listen today and not fall asleep? Number one, you've got people watching you, and you'll get demerits. Number two, as I said before, Afghanistan is our longest war. And just because you are reading about the troops coming home doesn't mean the war is ending. So it's important that we understand what happened there. And in particularly, we talk about the Afghan National Security Forces, their police, their army, and their air force. Because many of you, and I say many of you, may be called to go out there on some mission in the future either training, advising, assisting, or defending troops, or combating terrorist activities. So listen, and listen hard, because this is significant. We have spent 14 years and $68 billion trying to build the Afghan National Security Forces. Whether they can do the job is important not only to the taxpayer, who has funded it, but to you and your colleagues who may be relying on those forces in the future. So let's talk about the Afghan National Security Forces. But maybe before I do that, I should stop for a minute and explain 
who I am, what I do, why I do what I do, and what we've accomplished since I was appointed to SIGAR. So let me talk about that odd tobacco flavored acronym, SIGAR. It's SIGAR with an S, not a C. I have nothing to do with Castro or Cuban cigars. I am the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. When I took this job, and let me say, if you don't know what I, cigar is, don't feel bad. Most people don't know what cigar is, and I was actually shocked how many people know even what an independent inspector general is or does. That was probably my first awakening uh, when I took the job and realized how few people in USAID state and, yes, even the Department of Defense who did not understand the role of an inspector general and particularly an independent inspector general by statute and SIGAR in particular because we are probably the most independent of all inspectors general. Congress created my office in 2008 to provide independent and objective oversight of that $110 billion investment in reconstruction. After broad and public dissatisfaction in Congress about the performance of the first cigar, my predecessor, President Obama appointed me to lead the agency in July 2012. Now, I will ask you, if you want to know why I'm aggressive, there are many reasons, but go on YouTube, plug in Cigar, General Fields, and Senator McCaskill. And in five minutes, you will see a retired three-star general almost brought to tears for not being aggressive enough and not carrying out his mission. I remind generals of that when they ask me why are we so aggressive. I remind ambassadors of that. I just say, look what happened to my predecessor. My job is to assist the government in running the reconstruction efforts better and in protecting taxpayers' assets. So I wear the green eye shades of an auditor as well as carry the badge, the guns, the bullets, and the handcuffs of a law enforcement officer. That's what an independent inspector general does. SIGAR issues audit reports highlighting the problems we find. We make recommendations, but we also arrest criminals, including members of the military and civil service who steal money. And I'm sorry to say, just last week, four military members were sentenced to prison terms up to 15 years in jail for stealing millions of dollars from the U.S. taxpayer in Afghanistan based upon one of our cases. So not only does fraud kill, if you commit fraud and we catch you, we will send you to jail. Uh, and that's unfortunately a learning experience that those people will remember for the next 10 to 15 years. Since 2008, SIGAR has identified over $2 billion in savings, representing a return of approximately $8 for every dollar of our appropriations. We have also saved the U.S. government more than $790 million. Our audits and inspections have identified nearly $1.3 billion in question costs and funds we could put to better use. In addition, as I have noted, we have arrested and convicted over 100 people and we've done all that at an annual budget of about $50 million per year. Our mission is clearly stated in the authorizing statute to keep the President and the administration and Congress, quote unquote, fully and currently informed about problems and deficiencies in Afghanistan reconstruction. And I will note, you know, you, you probably will have a congressman or senator tell you he walks around with the Constitution. <laughs> I walk around, these are my Bibles, the 1978 Inspector General Act and the 1988 Act creating me. This is what my job is supposed to do. And I dare people, and I've been criticized for not highlighting positive stuff in Afghanistan, I dare you to find anything in these statutes that says I'm supposed to be a cheerleader 
or a major proponent of any of the programs. That's why DOD has a public affairs office, probably about the size of a small division. Uh, that's why the State Department and AID have public affairs offices that are 10 times bigger than my entire agency. I have all of one person, two people, in my public affairs office now. So nowhere does it say we are supposed to highlight successes, but we do when we find them. Now, the difference of SIGAR versus inspectors general that you may see in the services, the Navy inspector general per, per, uh, in, in particular, or the DOD IG, is in three key areas we are different. First, we are a temporary agency. We are going to go out of business when the amount of authorized, appropriated, but not yet spent reconstruction money falls below 250 million. So, as a result, we have to do our job quickly. The instructions I received from Congress, as well as the White House, when I took this job were short and sweet. Fix it, and fix it fast. I don't have time for a five-year or 10-year proposal. I have a job to do, since I actually believe when you take an oath of office, and not oath, O-A-F, O-A-T-H, uh, you got to abide by it. And my oath of office was to fix it and fix it fast. Uh, and just so you know, even though we go out of business after 250 million, the amount of money that's authorized and appropriated but not yet spent right now is 12 billion. And guess what? Congress just authorized six more billion for Afghanistan. So technically, we may be around for a while, but still, I work on the idea that we are a temporary agency, and it should be a temporary agency. The second way we're different than any other inspector general is that we're not housed in any particular government agency. Do you have a DOD IG, a state IG, an aid IG? They are housed in those individual agencies. We are not. We are basically looking at any US government agency spending reconstruction dollars in Afghanistan. So they specifically wanted us to be objective and independent, so they did not house us in any agency. I, in essence, report to Congress and the President of the United States. The third thing is, as I said, we have broad interagency authorities and an interagency mission. Congress gave SIGAR blanket authority to examine any and all Afghan reconstruction funds spent by any and all U.S. government agencies. And this is really significant. I had a conversation a year ago with General Allen, who you all know, used to run our forces in Afghanistan. He specifically, John Allen said, you are the only agency in the government who has got the brief, got the responsibility to look at how the agencies work. And more importantly, if you look at my Bible, you look at the statute, we are the only agency empowered to look at how we cooperate with the Afghans and how we cooperate with our allies. So let me be clear. Only SIGAR is mandated by statute to assess these efforts and make recommendations on the whole of government approach to reconstruction in Afghanistan. And that includes, as I said, how well we coordinate. Now that's important for you. Because the next time we do this, it's going to be a whole of government approach. And it will be a whole of government's approach, including our allies, in that effort. So it's important for somebody who's independent to analyze what went wrong and what went right. Lessons learned on how to do it better. Now that you know who we are, let me focus on that area of reconstruction that is the key to Afghan's future, and I believe the key to your future involvement in Afghanistan. And that is the capabilities of the Afghan security forces. This is a topic of great importance because the success of the Afghan national security forces really will determine the success of our longest war in Afghanistan. Considering the effect of a lack of security has on the average Afghan's lives, 
the peace process, good governance, rule of law, economic and social development, the capacity of the security forces is, in my estimation, the most important issue to not only the Afghan people, but to the U.S. taxpayer. Getting a clear picture of Afghan national security force strengths and capabilities has been a challenge for the last 12 years. Optimistic assessments of progress often tell only part of the story and downplay long-standing problems such as high attrition rates among the Afghans, questionable capability reporting, and unverified personnel counts. Many of the problems we face today, and General Campbell faces today, he just testified yesterday before the Senate Armed Services Committee, are the same problems we faced last year or even three years ago when I started my job. Since its creation, SIGAR, through its audit work and quarterly reports, has expressed repeatedly serious concerns about the capability of the Afghan government and the ANDSF forces, that's the police and army, to, and to carry out their duties as well as long-term sustainability. Adjusting for inflation, just to keep in mind again what we're talking about, $110 billion we've spent in reconstruction. That is more money than we spent on the entire Marshall Plan after World War II to reconstruct all of Europe. That's one other reason why they created my office, because Congress knew that was a lot of money, and they didn't trust the oversight mechanisms currently in existence. Now, of that $110 billion, about $65 billion have gone to the uh, developing an Afghan security apparatus. Now, CSTICA, or the Combined Security Transition Command Afghanistan, has long been the steward for the vast majority of that money that was spent. Without a doubt, C. Sticka has had some remarkable successes, especially considering the challenges of working in a war zone. Afghanistan is neither safe nor an easy place to work. Everyone, military and civilian alike, who put their lives on the line to work there deserve our gratitude and respect. So it is with no disrespect whatsoever for their accomplishments or sacrifice that I will lay out today a critique of that 14-year investment. It is an unvarnished look at past efforts to help our current military personnel in Afghanistan and Washington learn from the past. In particular, as I said, I want to look at ANDSF capability. I want to look at their personnel numbers, and I want to look at sustainability. Those are three key issues that we look at all the time and are important for you. When we look at capabilities, uh, the key indicators of effectiveness is our effort to build, train, equip, and sustain those forces. Uh, why are we interested in that? Well, if they don't have those capabilities, we don't know if they can fight. We don't know if they have the resources to defeat that determined insurgency. And we don't know if they can keep the Afghan civilian population safe or manage to sustain themselves without coalition assistance. SIGAR has long voiced its concern about the capability and the methodologies we used to assess it. Since 2005, the US has changed the system used to assess the ANDSF four times. In June 2010, our audit report of the first system found that units deemed capable of operating independently, unquote, could not sustain the gains they had made. We found significant levels of regression or backsliding in the capability of fielded army and police units. And specifically, between 2009 and 2010, about 40% of the top-rated army units and 70% of the top-rated police districts had regressed at least one level. Now, before we issued that report, ISAF, the International Security Assistance Force, changed the rating system. 
With that new system in place, the number of Afghan National Security Force units with the top rating fell to zero. Then in October 2014, ISAF unexpectedly classified significant portions of their most recent assessment report. Up to then, we had been reporting on a quarterly basis uh, the military's evaluation of the ANDSF. After the decision to classify the information that had previously been deemed fit for public consumption just months earlier, the public lost all visibility over the capabilities of the ANDSF. And actually, only a few congressional staff had the clearances to see those, that new material. Now, Resolute Support, at our urging, budged a little in March 2015 and issued its fourth ANDSF measurement tool in 10 years. This one, at least, was unclassified. Uh, we don't know if it's still a useful tool, because they're still doing an assessment. But it is interesting that after 10 years of assessments, where ANDSF ratings have yo-yoed back and forth, back and forth with every new system, I cannot be, be anything but skeptical whether we are going to see improvements. Moreover, in 2015, again, after 10 years of reporting, including times in which the ANDSF units have been rated as independent, it is troubling that the most recent assessment found that the Afghan army had not achieved the highest rating level in any category. Now, it's not just the Afghan troops I'm worried about. It is the Afghan ministries. Senior U.S. military and uh, leaders in Afghanistan told me that it will take years and years for the Afghans to master their essential functions and that they will not master any of these essential functions by the time the U.S. currently plans to shrink its military presence at the end of 2016. This is debate, the debate going on right now if you read the press. This is what's going on right now at the NSC with General Campbell and his advisors discussing what to do and how many troops to have to do that train, advise, and assist that is relevant to your future uh, in the military. Now, uh, the most recent assessment of the Ministries of Defense and Interior seemed to confirm these concerns, as I may have mentioned before. Uh, only four offices in their respective ministries are deemed, quote, capable of autonomous operations. Now, despite what all these assessments say, the U.S. military has publicly said it will make large gains in the next 15 months. Again, see, it's my job. I'm like Ronald Reagan, trust but verify. It's my job to ask those tough questions. I am a bit skeptical by those claims we have seen in the press. Uh, why would one expect to see faster progress now rather than at any point during the last 14 years of reconstruction effort when the number of U.S. and coalition personnel available to train, advise, and assist is so greatly reduced? We have seen ambitious goals set in the past, often followed by the moving of goalposts uh, with those goals when those goals seem increasingly out of reach. It is more important, I think, for the ANDSF capabilities to be accurately tracked, assessments based on real measurable criteria, and goals that are realistic and attainable. Which brings me to a second area where we have great concerns, and that is the actual number of military and police people in Afghanistan. Uh, the importance of accurate and reliable Afghan army and police personnel data to the U.S. and Afghan governments cannot be overstated. As you all well know, professional military and police forces around the world, probably going back to the time of George Washington, begin each day with a roll call by identifying how many personnel are present for duty and what capabilities or abilities that force has. 
This allows commanders to determine operational capabilities. The number of assigned personnel is a key indicator of the Afghan government's ability to defend against the insurgency, keep its population secure, and prevent terrorists from staging new attacks. In addition, this data is used as a basis for determining other requirements, such as recruiting, equipment needs, salaries, and medical care, all provided by the U.S. taxpayer. Data on assigned Afghan personnel also helps the U.S. and the coalition partners, including General Campbell and President Obama right now, determine the appropriate pace for any potential drawdown. And until the Afghan government can fully fund and sustain its security forces, the United States and the coalition need accurate personnel data to determine the amount of funding. Unfortunately, SIGAR has repeatedly, and so has our, our friends in the GAO and the DODIG, repeatedly raised concerns about the accuracy of the ANDS personnel numbers. The bottom line is, we don't know how many are there. We have no accurate <coughs> ability to determine how many police there are how many soldiers there are, how many airmen. And what is very troubling is in that country, there is an incentive to lie because there are numerous ghost employees. You take their salary. You lie. You take the money that was supposed to go for food, for weapons, and for whatever. You inflate the numbers. And that is the bottom line of what our concern is. Now, we became increasingly concerned about those numbers in July of 2012, shortly after I started, when we started to see anomalies in the data being reported. We saw civilians counted as uniform personnel. Later, we found that somebody, we didn't, couldn't identify who, actually changed and plugged in a number to make the numbers match on a number of troops. And we don't know where they came up with that number. We still are trying to find that out. And in reports released in January and April of this year uh, on the processes used to collect and verify the accuracy, SIGAR found there's still no assurance that the data is accurate. Uh, we know C. Sticka is trying to fix this. But as of now, we have no idea how many people are out there fighting the bad guys. Now, this is critical. I'm not saying Afghanistan is the same as Iraq. But do we all recall reading the reports after what happened in Iraq when we found out that many of the Iraqi divisions were paper divisions? They had been invented out of whole cloth. So corrupt officials could collect the salaries. That is our concern. Our concern also is not only wasting taxpayer dollars, but what it could be in regards to the ability of the Afghans to basically fight off the bad guys. Again, while I still remain skeptical of the numbers, I'm encouraged that General Campbell and uh, under him, the head of Sistica, have been trying very hard to try to fix that problem. But uh, we still don't have a good fix for it. Now, finally, I want to talk about ANDSF, Afghan National Security Forces, long-term sustainability. This is another critical issue that we've raised concerns about, and it is very, very critical to our ultimate success in Afghanistan. The evidence strongly suggests the Afghans lack the capacity, whether financial, technical, managerial, or otherwise, to maintain, support, and execute much of what has been built or established during those 14 years of Reconstruction. Without donor and continued donor contributions, the Afghan government will not be able to meet most 
of its operating or development expenditures. The International Monetary Fund expects the budget gap between what the Afghans raise in revenue and what they need of about seven to eight billion dollars per year. NATO has said that it expects the Afghan government will assume full financial responsibility for its security forces in 2024, but to be quite honest with you, I think that is overly optimistic. Under the even the most optimistic GDP growth scenarios, the Afghan government can't meet its payroll and operation costs by 2024. Afghanistan, and one of the reasons is because Afghanistan has one of the lowest rates of revenue collection in the world. And the flood of refugees leaving that country is a testament to the failure of the Afghan economy. In terms of technical capacity, the Afghan security forces will need our help for the foreseeable future. If our Afghan partners are to succeed, we must accept that fact now. Now, I'm not alone in this assessment. Some of the most salient comments on Afghan security sustainability has come not from me, but from our U.S. military commanders in Afghanistan. General Dunford, the former commander of ISAF and U.S. forces, told Congress that they will need assistance in maturing their systems for years to come. And on Tuesday, General Campbell reiterated similar concerns. Now, this is not abstract concern. This isn't a little physics problem that you face. This has real consequences. <laughs> News reports from Afghanistan are noting record casualty lever levels by the Afghan security forces. We have heard repeatedly, and you've probably read those reports too, of Afghan army units clearing an area of insurgents, handing it over to their police, and then they find that the police cannot stand up to the insurgents on their own. And just in the past few weeks, we have all read with great interest about the loss of the provincial capital of Kunduz. Now, this is not a small village. This is a city of 300,000 people that temporarily fell to the Taliban. And as of this date, they still haven't been cleared out, despite happy talk coming out of the Kabul and Afghan press. This, I just want to remind you, is the first provincial capital to fall to the insurgents since our troops arrived in 2001. Meanwhile, as you well know from your courses on counterinsurgency, insurgents will always have some inherent advantages over the government forces. Insurgents don't have to hold territory. Insurgents can avoid pitch battles. Insurgents can force the government to defend everywhere. The old whack-a-mole defense, which everyone has written about, that's what the Afghan government's been forced to do this last year. And insurgents, if pressed, can fade into the population. They can slowly whittle the government forces down and use the terrorist acts to undermine popular support. And most importantly, insurgents can wait. Now, like government forces in Vietnam, Iraq, Algeria, and the ANDS, the, the, and, and, and elsewhere, the, the Afghan security forces face serious challenges, even if fully staffed, trained, and equipped. Although not exactly comparable, we must recall that the Soviet, Soviet client regime in Kabul collapsed not when the Soviets left, but in 1992, less than a year later, after the Soviets stopped delivering cash and fuel. South Vietnam fell to the North Vietnamese regulars in April 1975 after a drastic, drastic reduction of U.S. aid, and let me remind you, just four months after the Viet Cong were able to capture their first provincial capital in South Vietnam, after 30 years of fighting. 
as any student of history knows, conflict can turn into crisis, which can turn into calamity in a heartbeat. That is why the three issues I talked about are so important, not only to our mission there, but are important to our national security elsewhere, because we have to get it right. Reconstructing a poor country like Afghanistan while its government is fighting a tough and highly motivated insurgency calls for a long view, deep pockets, and patience. The train and advise and assist role for the Afghan international partners has now taken the form of the Resolute Support Mission. General Campbell and his staff have a tough job ahead of them in creating the conditions that will help the Afghan security forces become self-sustaining. It will not happen overnight. And I want to remind you, so you can remind your parents and your family and friends, the fact that the troop level may be going down does not mean the war is over and does not mean our reconstruction efforts have ended. We have seen too often the consequence of setting lofty goals on unrealistic timelines with inadequate resources. We will not win Afghanistan with a press release. We will need real programs with realistic objectives and adequate resources for years to come. And I think it is worth mentioning that military tours in Afghanistan, as we all well know, are short by design. People show up, are briefed by people they are replacing, and then scramble to figure out what they need to do to ensure progress is maintained and also to get a good performance ready. It can take months just to get the lay of the land. References to things that happened only a few years ago, say 2012, might as well be references to the last ice age or to General Grant. I worry sometimes that this, as much as anything else, is why we at SIGAR keep seeing a pattern of constantly changing assessment systems personnel goals, and sustainment milestones, changes which don't always translate into meaningful progress. If there's one thing you should learn from your days here at the Academy, change does not mean progress. It's got to be changed with a purpose, and it has to be sustainable in the long term. For this and other reasons, my office is developing a series of lessons learned reports to draw on the lessons of the past to inform future decision making. To do this, we have brought together some very bright people to SIGAR with a wealth of on the ground experience in Afghanistan to conduct interviews, do research, etc. That's one of the reasons why I was up at Princeton the other day. It wasn't just to give a speech and why I keep talking to many of your colleagues in DOD. They have the on-the-ground experience that can help us put together those lessons learned. Uh, I hope uh, those of you who are either going to Afghanistan or are interested in the topic of reconstruction in uh, uh, post-conflict uh, areas will read some of our audit reports, our inspections, but more importantly, wait till we start producing some of these lessons learned reports. You know, after 13 years and billions of dollars, we have plenty of examples of what works and what doesn't. What we're doing now is trying to pull out the best practices to help us in the future. Lastly, I want to say that I strongly believe in the U.S. mission in Afghanistan. That is why we need to get it right. A strong, secure, and self-sustaining Afghanistan is important for stability in the region the well-being of over 30 million Afghans, and ultimately the security of our country. Now more than ever, with President Ghani and CEO Abdullah as new willing partners, and the energetic and aggressive U.S. military leadership of General Campbell and his team, we should all be, what I have said repeatedly over the last, since January, cautiously optimistic about a brighter future for Afghanistan. With that, 
thank you very much, and I'm open to any questions and critiques. Do you want me five minutes? Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, we get pushback. The pushback is usually from nameless, faceless bureaucrats whose job's on the line or uh, a career on the line or who don't know what an independent inspector general. And they will try to thwart us. We do not get pushback from the adults in the room. We have never gotten a pushback from the President of the United States, the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, the senior adults people who understand and appreciate the role of independent oversight. It's usually people who would like us to classify everything and push it under the, uh, the door. The problem is, and I, I will quote somebody, and I can go on about this, but if you want to change things, you got to sometimes reach over those bureaucrats to the American people and to Congress to change things. You read the, uh, the works of uh, Supreme Court Justice Brandeis, where he said the best disinfectant is sunlight, is public disclosure of problems. That's what we follow. Uh, and we have our ways to get information. When the American people in Congress are behind you, we don't, we're not thwarted in our job. OK? Let me, yes, sir. We only have about five minutes. I spoke a little too long. So anyway, go on. Uh, that's a tough one. I don't think we have the answer to that yet. We see a lot of inefficiencies in planning, strategy, and then execution. The biggest inefficiency we see is where there is no personal accountability. You can waste a billion dollars in Afghanistan and not lose a job or not lose a promotion. I think that's a key element. The, we, we put out seven questions, and I ask you all to go on our website. Seven questions everybody should ask before they go to Afghanistan and work on a program. And one of the easiest one is, have you talked to the Afghans? Do they want the program? Do they need it? And can they use it? Do you consider security when you design a program? Do you consider the fact that there is rampant corruption when you design a program? That doesn't mean you don't do the program. It means you take it into consideration when you design it and implement it. The biggest problem we see is oversight. Not just by me. By the time my people show up, it's like the CIS detective show. The body's been carted out. All there is is a gentle little uh, uh, body painted on the ground. The first line of defense against corruption and stupidity will be you. When you're an officer out there carrying out the mission. Now that's tough because there may be some people in your chain of command who don't want to hear the truth. That's why you have inspectors general. We give you top cover. That's why Congress created us in 78. We give top cover to the people like yourself who know what the problems are and want to fix it. So that's, that's the best line of defense. Yes, sir. Boy, uh, I think we got enough money for everything. Uh, no, uh, you know something? Procurement. We actually got to spend more money in developing, like Ronald Reagan did. Because I was here when we did the build up on the Soviets. We developed a procurement core, a core where you could advance and you could get promoted and you could do a good job and keep going. We need to think about doing that again. Because procurement is broken, as all you know, in the military and in many agencies. One last thing I want to say. I know some of you have to leave. The problems we've identified in Afghanistan does not mean that the people in Afghanistan, your colleagues, are evil or bad or sinister or more stupid than usual. The problems we are identifying 
are problems inherent with the way the US government works. When you're in a war zone, it's like being on steroids. Every problem gets escalated, okay? So the problems we've identified on procurement Remember, DOD procurement has been on the high risk list of the GAO since 1991. It's never been fixed. So the problems you've seen and hear about in the VA, the problems you see in HHS, or the problems in the Homeland Security Department that you've all read about, or Secret Service, are the same problems in Afghanistan. It's only intensified because there's a war going on, they're shooting, and there was such a desire to do good, so we poured a heck of a lot of money. Walk away from this. Next time we do it, maybe we should stop and think about not spending so much money so fast in so poor a country with so little oversight. The four so's. If you do that, you will reap disaster. Okay? Sorry, I gotta leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.